I was also a keen scuba diver. So I started wow. seeing the impact of climate change in particular on our seas and in our oceans. And I wanted to be in a role that I could do something about it. And, you know, now at BT Group, I can demonstrate for a large corporate what can be done, what our ambitions are, uh, what our journey has been, and hopefully inspire others to see if we can do this, what can they do? Welcome to Big Time Sustainability. Big Time Sustainability is brought to you by Center for Big Synergy, and it is a United Nations Global Goals initiative. On this show, global leaders and changemakers tell us how they are combating major challenges like climate change, loss of biodiversity, hunger, poverty, inequality, and many more. Big Time Sustainability aims to inspire all of us to follow these leaders and act with urgency to create a more sustainable world. If you are a changemaker or know someone who is making a big difference in their community or globally and should be on this show, please email us at podcast at thebigsynergy.org or visit www.thebigsynergy.org. Do you think you care about climate change? Are you worried about the impact of climate change on the lives of your loved ones? Do you think you can do anything to combat the impact of climate change with your own actions? If you have answered yes, then listen on. Because on this show, you can find out how, as an individual, you can harness the power of big business, perhaps as an employee, or run your own enterprise more sustainably, or perhaps start a new enterprise, or a not-for-profit, or even volunteer for someone to make a tangible difference to the lives of millions by addressing the major issues faced by us and the planet. Welcome to Big Time Sustainability. I am Dr. Saurav Roy, the founder and chief executive of Center for Big Synergy, a civil society organization of the United Nations. In today's show, I am welcoming a very special guest, Gabriel Geiner the Head of Environmental Sustainability of British Telecommunications. In today's show, we will follow Gabrielle on her incredible journey to becoming one of the world's leading sustainability champions and learn from her experiences and some practical tips perhaps that we can pick up on the way, how we all can follow her footsteps and start making difference to the lives of millions who are faced with one of the major challenges that the planet and the people face at this given point of time. Welcome to Big Time Sustainability. So Gabriel, for the benefit of our global audience, please could you um, share a little bit more about your journey to becoming one of the world's leading sustainability leaders? Yeah, of course. So for those who don't know us, I'm from BT Group. We're formerly British Telecom. We're one of the world's leading communications providers and the UK's leading provider of fixed and mobile services and related digital solutions. We also uh, provide managed services primarily to multinational companies across 180 uh, countries in the world. Uh, so taking climate action is nothing new for BT Group. It's something that we've been doing for more than 30 years, actually. We set our first carbon reduction target in 1992. And that was, of course, before companies were even thinking about setting carbon reduction targets. And in 2008, we set our first science-based target and that was to reduce the carbon emissions intensity of our business by 80% by 2020. We met that target four years um, ahead of time. So after meeting that target, we decided to be even more ambitious. And following um, the Paris Agreement, I thought to myself, well, what does it mean to be a leader on climate action? 
Of course, that means to set a new science based target aligned to 1.5 degree pathway. So I'm very proud that as BT, we were the third company in the world to get this kind of science based target validated by the science based targets initiative. That now means that we're going to be net zero for our own operations by the end of March 2031 and for our supply chain and customer emissions by the end of March 2041. So Gabriel, what inspires you in particular to do more for business or society so that they can evolve into more sustainable ways? Yeah, so um, I'm Swedish. Uh, I was born in, in, in Sweden and I spent part of, of my life and now every summer um, on an island in the Baltic Sea. I was also a keen scuba diver. So I started wow. seeing the impact of climate change in particular on our seas and, and our oceans. And I wanted to be in a role that I could do something about it. And, you know, now at BT Group, I can demonstrate for a large corporate what can be done, what our ambitions are, uh, what our journey has been, and hopefully inspire others to see if we can do this, what can they do? What have we done? And I think what inspires me particularly is the personal impact that I can have. I can actually change the path of my company. I can um, inspire other, our suppliers to do things differently and other organizations and companies around the world just through sharing what we've been able to do. Now, careers within sustainability within big businesses are evolving very fast. What would you advise someone who is um, planning to transition into a role or start a career within big business and sustainability? Perhaps if you do, then I, don't. I, th I think two things. If you think about a role in sustainability, it covers actually a lot of technical issues. So, you know, that's carbon footprinting, reporting and disclosure, circular economy. So I think having some kind of background in that would be really useful. But secondly, um, sustainability is also a generalist area because having experience in business transformation and project managing management, because what we're trying to do, we're trying to change um, companies. So having those skills could also be very useful. I think passion, optimism, and resilience are key personal traits. You have to believe in what you're doing and that you're having an impact and being passionate about it. I think getting stuff done in this space is all around collaboration. So you need to be able to get other people to work with you and come with you on this journey. So a don't to me is if you don't have that passion, if you don't believe in this, if you don't have that long term optimism and resilience, you're going to find it quite difficult because this is a, a long term project that we're working on. No, I, I agree. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Okay. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Great. Great. So, Gabriel, so, uh, we know you've had a long career within British telecommunications. So how have you contributed towards British telecommunications climate journey so far? And um, what does the future hold? Yeah, so I, I've been in the, the BT sustainability team now for 14 years. I don't come from a sustainability background, uh, apart from my own passion. It was not something people studied at university when, when I went, when I was there. So I came to it in for in more of a transformational kind of project management uh, expertise. My focus has been on strategy and thought leadership and managing projects which would put BT in a climate leadership position. Um, so that has been, for example, developing our 1.5 science based target, setting up uh, a supplier engagement program and also uh, a methodology for how we calculate how BT can help our customers reduce their carbon emissions. I've also been focusing on advocacy and acting as BT spokesperson and representative in a number of external trade association and fora 
I've been BT's representative at COPS since 2015 and just really working with policymakers and, and NGOs. So in terms of the future, for me, I'm always trying to look at what's next. You know, if you want to be a climate leader, what do you think need to do and think about next? And for us, uh, what's most current is around nature and biodiversity. How can we start looking at the impacts and opportunities for BT in that space? Now, BT preponed its net zero target to 2030 from 2045 for its own operational emissions and 2040 for its supply chain and customer emissions. Uh, from a layman's perspective, it's often difficult to understand why major businesses are taking so long to transition to net zero despite the imminent need to meet the 1.5 degree target. Some major businesses are setting net zero targets far into the next decade or even further away. So um, Gabriel, in your opinion, uh, what is the reason for this delay? Is it just profit? or is it linked to other factors such as infrastructure, uh, technology, uh, policy, particularly for businesses in your sector? So I, I think when, when we look at decarbonizing our operations, we have already tackled what many would see as the low hanging fruit. Um, we uh, use 100% renewable electricity around the world since 2020. But our biggest challenge now is decarbonizing our fleet. Um, as BT Group, we have um, 33,000 vehicles out there. That's 80% of our remaining carbon emissions for our operations. And our fleet is deployed all over the UK. So you can imagine you know, remote islands of Scotland, uh, very remote areas where no one is really um, living. And we also have um, specialist vehicles. So we need vehicles for people to be able to climb up poles. Um, our vans need to contain ladders and equipment and cables and very heavy stuff. Um, so in terms of that, um, those vehicles don't really exist in the market today. So what we've been trying to do is to send demand signals to the market saying, yes, we want to decarbonize our operations by the end of March 2031. But to do that, we need um, the supply of these um, ultra low emission vehicles to to be available for us. We also, you know, if you look at where our engineers are out and about, the charging infrastructure is not there. So where right. are they going to charge their their vehicles? So those are some of the challenges that we thought we put a timeline to 2031. Um, if we send the demand signals, this might happen. We need the technology. We need the, the policy environment to help us to make that change. And that's why we can't, unfortunately, you know, go net zero tomorrow. All right. Great. No, I think that I think that gives a very realistic perspective, because when we speak as a um, civil society organization who are trying to further the global goals, uh, the you know, the, the person on the street would commonly ask, you know, why can't big business act today? Uh, but there are several steps, as you've mentioned, and there's several other businesses involved. So it's it's a matter of uh, collaborative action uh, more so. Great. Um, so, I mean, as you've mentioned, you know, um, and as we know, BT involves its customers very much so as well to uh, its journey on net zero. So, um, what what does it do with the wider society generally, uh, so to say, to help it evolve um, to a more sustainable way? So our purpose as BT Group is to connect for good. We're using our products and services to help wider society reduce their carbon emissions and reach net zero. So we have a very specific target looking at wider society, which is to help our customers avoid 60 million tons of carbon by 2030. So how are we doing that? We are rolling out super fast broadband across the UK and through digital technologies like ours, people are able to meet and talk without traveling. They can work from home. 
um, they can run a multinational business from their kitchen table. Actually, they can, yeah. you know, have a consultation with their doctor through our technology and connect just like we're doing today without having to travel. And looking at broader sectors of society, we're helping industries become more efficient through things like fleet planning. We're using software and apps to optimize how fleets travel. We're looking at efficient manufacturing, we're using AI, IoT, all these new technologies that will help, for example, monitor, assess and optimize um, energy use. So we're trying to help other sectors through digital technology um, to reduce their carbon emissions. All right, great. Good to know that. So, I mean, as um, I think you've alluded several times, um, there are three key stakeholders, obviously, the government, big business and society. So, in your opinion, what where do you see are the untapped areas of collaboration between government and big business and uh, business and the civil society uh, to help each other evolve uh, more sustainably? I, th I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, that's what it comes down to. This collaboration between business, government and civil society, because that's how we've been able to make progress, for example, through on renewables, on science based targets. And um, we we you know, that's the model of change that I certainly believe in. So let's just give me let me give you an example. In 2020, we joined forces with the Climate Group, um, who is an NGO. Uh, we launched something called the UK Electric Fleets Coalition. We now have 25 companies and some of the largest commercial fleet operators in the UK as members. And we're all advocating for a faster adoption of electric vehicles in the UK and the kind of, of policy environment that we need to do that and to speed up the, the transition. So we see ourselves as, you know, here are companies coming together, working with civil society, having a voice, talking to policymakers about this is how we can drive change. And I think we need more of those initiatives. We need more people to get together as business, as civil society, as government to tackle specific issues. All right, great. I think that's that's kind of underscores our role as a facilitator, Center for Big Synergy. Uh, so, uh, Gabriel, I mean, I, I understand in principle this should work, but what are the practical challenges? Things are happening, but not perhaps as you and I would expect um, to be in the volumes of even more collaborations, more initiatives. What, what do you think are the biggest challenges in having more such collaborations working successfully? I think one of the th challenges for some businesses around is around competitive issues. Um, you know, why do I want to share my net zero plans and my challenges with other people? Is that competitive information? Do I really want to talk about it? I think though, what we have done in, in my sector, certainly in the ICT sector, is be able to overcome some of those challenges. We, you know, as I said, I've been in this job for 14 years. I work very closely with some of our biggest competitors because we feel that by sharing this and and working together, we can work towards the better good. So, you know, we are working together to encourage suppliers to report to CDP, to disclose their carbon data. We're working together um, on coming up with methodologies on carbon accounting for our sector. We work together to commission research and publishing reports. So I think it it's it's a common challenge so it's about you know being open about what your challenges are and, and just saying well hey is this something that we can work on together right okay no i think you know keeping that communication open is vital i think if I mean, if anyone wants to take you know the core message away um is that happening more often now than you think it was happening maybe five ten years ago D definitely, definitely. I, you know, I think I see a groundswell in how certainly in my sector we're trying to do 
more together and we're seeing the power of, of the collective to try again to change markets, to change supplier behavior and to work together with government and policy makers. Right. Great. No, great to know that. So, I mean, as a not for profit or a small business who obviously would want to follow your lead and uh, probably form an alliance or collaborate um, to help each other progress towards more sustainable ways. I mean, you've already taken um, huge strides, um, but for organizations who are still trying to achieve that um, and for not-for-profits who could collaborate on something like, as you mentioned about um, the electric fleet, um, what what sort of opportunities are there for um, any of these? So not-for-profits or smaller uh, and medium scale businesses to work together with BT. So let me highlight supply chain. When we look at BT's end to end carbon emissions, only 6% of those come from our own operations. 73% are from our upstream supply chain and 20% from customers using our products and services. So Working with suppliers for us is key to reach net zero. Obviously, suppliers uh, include SMEs because they make up so such a big part of our economy. But for large companies like BT, we have, as you can imagine, thousands of suppliers. So we can't, unfortunately, engage with all of them. Uh, and we need to spread that message, which is why we work with the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, which is a, a non-for-profit. Um, we set up with Ericsson, Telia, Ikea and Unilever something called the 1.5 Supply Chain Leaders. And we launched something called the SME Climate Hub because we wanted to reach out specifically to SMEs knowing that we can't have one-to-one -one engagement with them, but we want to help them on the net zero journey. You know, where do they start? What do they need to think about? What can they do to take action? We also worked with the UK government to engage SMEs. So uh, we, I did a lot of activities with the UK government in the run up to COP26. We had speaking engagements, conferences. We advertised the SME Climate Hub on, on the BT Tower, which is our big advertising tower in, in central London, just to try to engage um, SMEs on, on climate action. So we're trying to do a lot just to engage with SMEs, but of course it's a two-way right. street. You know, um, hey, you know, reach out to us. What do you need? How can we help? And there's so much more to do in that space. So if I could leave, you know, the listeners and, and the watchers of this with, with one thought is how can you help us? Have a look at the resources that we've developed through the SME Climate Hub, through 1.5 supply chain leaders. And we really need to start, you know, spreading the word to build that whole exponential change that we need in big business and in small business and in governments. All right, great. I think those resources are something that I'm sure many of our listeners were not aware of. And uh, thanks for sharing those with us, Gabriel, so that you know they can look those up and uh, find means of engagement. Great. It was um, lovely speaking to you, Gabriel. That brings me to pretty much of you know to the end of um, our discussion. I'm sure um, your pearls of wisdom, practical advice, and insights, everything will help uh, every listener to uh, follow your lead and find inspiration either you know as an employee or as an entrepreneur or even someone like ourselves who are running not-for-profits uh, to follow your footsteps and uh, try and make uh, big changes uh, to the lives of millions thank you very much for your time on big time sustainability today well thank you very much so as we've heard from gabriel today the three key players or stakeholders are the government the businesses and you and me, which is the civil society or we the peoples, as is in the Charter of the United Nations. It is not a sprint, it is a marathon and it is only through collaboration, perhaps less competition, can these three stakeholders work together, just like how BT is trying to achieve right now, to take everyone on the journey 
towards a more sustainable future. Thank you everyone for joining on Big Time Sustainability today and we hope to be back with the next edition soon. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Big Time Sustainability. Please share, subscribe and join us again next time. If you are a change maker or know someone who is making a big difference in their community or globally and should be on this show, please email us at podcast at thebigsynergy.org or visit www.thebigsynergy.org.